So before we talk about instruments again, we need to talk briefly about um, this idea of compliance, um, because instruments are actually really foundational for measuring compliance um, to a program or to a policy. Um, and it influences the type of treatment effects that we can calculate um, when we're doing causal, uh, causal estimation and causal inference. Um, so briefly, we need to review this idea of potential outcomes, which we've talked about several times in this course, but we're going to talk about it again. Um, so the idea with potential outcomes is you're trying to find the causal effect of a program, which is this delta right here. Um, and you do that by basically saying, find the outcome, whatever it is, for people who use the program, and subtract that from the outcome for people who don't use the program. And that is the causal effect of the program. You can also write it like this here. We have delta equals the outcome when program is turned on minus the program when the outcome is turned off. Um, the issue with this, though, notice that there's no subscripts here or anything or bars. This means just population level when the program is on versus when the program is off. But we run into this issue here, which is the fundamental problem of causal inference, which we've mentioned many times already. This is the idea that you cannot observe individual level counterfactuals. So if you're trying to estimate the causal effect for an individual, that's this I here, what you would need to do is measure their outcome when they're in the program for that one individual and subtract the outcome when they're not in the program for that individual. But in real life, you can't actually see that. You either see their outcome if they're in the program or you see their outcome if they're not in the program, but you can never see both at the same time. And so the main fundamental problem of causal inference here is that individual level effects are impossible to observe. We don't have counterfactuals. We don't have a time machine where we can go back and see what would happen if they used the program or not. Um, so to get around that, we use something called the average treatment effect, which is the difference um, in the average outcomes here. Um, so another way of writing this is here with the bar over the Y. So this just means the causal effect is the average outcome when the program is on minus the average outcome when the program is off. So that is the average treatment effect, and it goes for the entire population. Um, so it is the, the average outcome for everybody in the study that you're looking at. Um, so every individual has a treatment or a causal effect. Um, in your exam, you had an example of this where you saw hypothetically what would happen to each person because we used the time machine mind reading column so you could see what their causal effect would be. So the average treatment effect is the average of all the unit causal, the unit level causal effects, or it is the average effect for the whole population. Um, ideally, when you're doing causal inference, you want to find the average treatment effect because that you can talk about general causal effects for a whole population. Um, but often that's tricky to do. Um, there are other versions of causal effects you can find. There's the average treatment on the treated. So this is the effect of the program just on people who were treated with the program. Um, you can also find things called conditional average treatment effects, which we talked about in previous sessions. This is where um, rather than looking at the effect on the treated, you look at the effect of the program on different characteristics. You look across gender, you look across age, you look across whatever. Um, conditional average treatment effect just means average treatment effect for different conditions, whatever conditions you want them to be. Average treatment on the treated is basically a conditional average treatment effect, but you're using treatment as the condition. Um, and so that's this Kate here is the conditional average treatment effect. Um, in the regression discontinuity session, we looked at this idea here, that when you're doing regression discontinuity, you are not finding an average treatment effect for an entire population. You are finding something called a local average treatment effect. And that is because when you're doing this analysis, you're only looking at people in this bandwidth here. So if you're looking at a bandwidth of five, you're throwing away all of this data on the outskirts here. And you're only looking at the causal effect of people in this bandwidth. If you shrink the bandwidth, you're only looking at the causal effect of these people here. Um, so you're not looking at a full population level causal effect. Um, and so with these local average treatment effects, you're actually getting a smaller version of the treatment effect. And it only applies to a portion of the population. This means you can't make any population level claims with the local average treatment effect. With regression discontinuity, you can't say that this program causes everybody on average to increase their outcome by some amount. You can say it causes people around the cutoff to increase their outcome by some amount, but you have to kind of include that caveat. 
otherwise you're you're being too general um, with your causal effects. Ultimately, that's okay, um, because as we mentioned a couple sessions ago when we talked about regression discontinuity and the fact that it is a local treatment effect, most estimates are technically local. Even if it is something like diff and diff where it's supposed to be a global thing, um, you're still just looking at whatever your treatment group and whatever your control group is. So if you're looking at like New Jersey and Pennsylvania, cool, you found an effect of, of the minimum wage in New Jersey, but there's no guarantee that that will apply to um, Montana raising its minimum wage or Romania raising its minimum wage or Bolivia raising its minimum wage. So it's still kind of a local treatment effect, um, even though we call it a, a regular full average treatment effect. So don't be afraid if, it, if you find a local average treatment effect. Live with the caveats, but also just know that everything is technically underneath everything, still a local version of a treatment effect. So with local average treatment effects in regression discontinuity, you're looking at people in the bandwidth. In randomized controlled trials and instrumental variable situations, the local average treatment effect that you're looking at is for something called the compliers. You're not looking at the treatment effect on people who are called non-compliers. So we need to briefly talk about this idea of compliance um, because this is important. When you do a, an instrumental variables approach, the estimate that you get, your coefficient for the education hat or whatever the, the exogenous version of your policy or your program is, that is a local average treatment effect just for compliers. It is not a global average treatment effect. So compliance is a special principle in this whole world of causal inference and has to deal with what people do if they're assigned to a treatment. So you have different groups of people. You have people who are called compliers so if they are assigned to be in a treatment group, they will do the treatment. If they're assigned to be in a control group, they won't do the treatment. Um, so these are like the obedient people. They do what you tell them to do. You have always takers who will get the treatment regardless of assignment. So if you assign them to be in the control group, they'll still go out and do the treatment. So if you're looking at like a bed net program, for instance, and you randomly assign people to use bed nets, um, and one person is in the control group, then they go out and buy their own bed net on their own and install it. They're an always taker. Um, you also have people called never takers, which are the opposite of the always takers. Uh, these people will reject the treatment regardless of assignment. So if you have a bed net program and you assign them to treatment, they're not going to use it. If you assign them to control, they also won't use it because they won't be in the treatment group, um, but they just won't use the treatment regardless. And then finally, we have this fun group here called the defiers which is the opposite of a complier. So a defier does the opposite of whatever, of whatever they're assigned to do. So if they are assigned to be in the treatment group, they will not do it. If they're assigned to be in the control group, they will do it. Um, they'll just be the opposite of, of what you do. These are like the toddlers of, of causal inference here. Um, so what this looks like here is if we look at this, this chart here, every person um, has potential outcomes um, for their compliance. So with com the way you read this chart here is um, each of these like dual boxes here is a person. And the, the, op the box on the left shows what they would do if they were assigned to be in the treatment group. And the box on the right shows what they would do if they were assigned to be in the control group. So if you're a complier, if, the, if you're this person, and you are assigned to be in the treatment group, then you're going to do it. And if you're assigned to be in the control group, you won't do it. Um, and so you have this whole world of compliers here. These are all people that will do what they're supposed to do. With the always takers, um, they will always do the treatment. They will always do the program regardless of what they're assigned. If they're assigned to treatment, they'll do it. If they're assigned to control, they'll still do it. And then we have the never takers here where they will never do the thing regardless of what they're assigned to. So that's kind of what we see in the population. If you notice, this is only three of the groups. We don't have defiers here. Um, if we did have defiers, it would look like compliers but opposite. It would say no right here and it would say yes right here. But to make life simpler um, and to make the whole math of this, this compliance stuff work, what we do in causal inference is we assume that there are no defiers. Um, we ignore them. Um, and that is a fairly safe assumption. There's still going to be defiers in the world. 
Um, but as far as like analyzing this stuff, we can generally assume that they don't exist. And the reason why is generally just because of how like trials work. If you're in a medical trial, in a drug trial, and you're a defier, that means you're assigned to the treatment group and then you don't do it. So sure, um, you'll get the medicine and then you won't do it. So that does happen in real life. But if you're assigned to the control group, if you're a defier, that means you have to go out and find the medicine because you were put in the control group and you have to go take it. And so you break into the lab and, and steal the medicine and take it because you're a defier. Um, that's tricky um, because you can't access the medicine unless you're in the treatment group. And so for that reason, we kind of assume that defiers don't exist or they're not going to exert influence on the outcomes. This also works with like international development things. So if you have a bed net RCT, a defier, um, if they were assigned the treatment, they would have to go home and rip down any existing bed nets just out of spite, um, which might happen, but we just assume that that's not going to be a thing. Um, so in general, we can just ignore the fires. There's a more technical reason for this. It's called this uh, the assumption of monotonicity. Um, and what this really means is that if you are assigned to treatment, it only has an effect in one direction. So being assigned to treatment is not going to decrease your chance of actually getting treated. So being assigned to treatment will always increase your chance of receiving the treatment itself. And that's this monotonicity assumption. And because of that, we can ignore the defiers. And so we can just uh, pretend they don't exist. They might exist in real life, but it's going to be really hard for them to show up. Um, in any of the results. So ignore them. So the way this works with this whole compliance idea is what we really want to be able to find is the effect of a program on the people who actually listen and who comply, because that's where we're going to be able to measure a causal effect. Um, if you assign an always taker to treatment, they're going to do it regardless. Um, and suddenly your control group for the always takers is going to be meaningless because if they're in the control group, they're still going to do it. Um, so what we really want to be able to do is focus just on the compliers. But in practice, this gets a little bit tricky because we don't have a time machine and we don't have a machine that lets us read people's minds. So if you look at this, we have a population with a bunch of people in it. Um, and if we could read their minds, we know that this person's a complier because they would do it if they were in treatment and they won't do it if they're in control. These are the always takers. They'll always do it regardless of what they're assigned to. These are the never takers. Cool. But when we actually collect the data, this is what we see. We say this person here, person number one, was assigned to be in the treatment group and they did it. Does that mean that they're a complier? And the answer is no. They could be a complier. If you look up here, they have a yes in this corner where they were assigned to be in the treatment group. So that means they could be a complier. That's a person who did it and was assigned to be in treatment. They could also be an always taker. We have no idea what this, this gray box is. And so a person who is assigned to treatment, who does the treatment, we don't know for sure who they are. They could be an always taker or they could be a complier. So it's both wrapped up into one potential person here. If you're assigned to treatment and you don't do it, the only possibility is that you're a never taker. Because again, we're ignoring the defiers um, and pretending they don't exist. So if you look up here in your population, um, somebody who's assigned to treatment and doesn't, it's not the compliers and it's not the always takers, it's these never takers. So we know that these people are the never takers. So that's a safe assumption. If somebody's assigned to the control group and they do it, they're guaranteed to be an always taker or a defier, but again, we're ignoring them. So if you look up here in your population again, the only group of people that have a yes in the control column are these always takers. So we know that they are going to be an always taker, this person here. If you are assigned to control and you don't do it, that does not guarantee that you're a complier. This person could be a complier or they could be a never taker. And we don't know which one it is. Ultimately, what we want to focus on is just the compliers. But the tricky part is the compliers are always wrapped up with another group of people. 
Um, the compliers here in the control group are wrapped up with the never takers. In the treatment group, the compliers are wrapped up with the always takers. So it would be really cool if we could somehow disentangle that and remove the always takers from the compliers and remove the never takers from the compliers, and then we'll know the effect of the program on the compliers. But as is, just right here, if you've calculated kind of the causal or the average of people in treatment minus the average of people in control, that would give you a causal effect, but that's also going to include the always takers and the never takers, and you don't necessarily want that. You want to find the average effect for just the compliers. So we can calculate a couple other different causal effects given this whole idea of compliance, where there's going to be some always takers and some never takers and some compliers in your population. So the first causal effect we can find is something called the intent to treat effect. This right here is the effect of being assigned to treatment. It doesn't measure the effect of actually receiving treatment or not. And the reason this is helpful is because it gets rid of the whole idea of compliers and always takers and never takers. So here, what you're really doing is just finding the effect of somebody, if they're in a randomized controlled trial, um, they're randomized to receive treatment, that is what you look at. Were they assigned to be in the treatment group? Were they assigned to be in the control group? Use that as kind of the treatment and control situation, not whether or not they actually did it. Um, so that gives you a version of a causal effect, but it doesn't really tell you a story of did the actual use of the program help? Um, because maybe they were assigned to treatment and they didn't do it. That doesn't tell you much about did the program work because they didn't do it. All this is really saying is does getting assigned to the treatment group have an effect? Um, so that's one version of a causal effect you can find. And it gets, it's, it, it gets rid of the, the distinction between compliers, always takers, and never takers. But it doesn't get you um, the complier causal effect. What we ultimately want when you have um, issues with compliance is you want the complier average causal effect or the CACE. This is a conditional average treatment effect. Um, the only reason we call it the CACE instead of the CATE is because the CATE acronym has already been taken by conditional average treatment effect. Um, so we can't call it that because it'll get confusing. So we call it the complier average causal effect. So this is really just the effect of the program, of actually using the program for compliers. So people who are not always takers, who are not never takers, the people who actually use the program. So this is the local average treatment effect for just the compliers. So if we look back at this right here, what we're focusing on is the causal effect of being assigned to treatment and complying with it. So we want this orange box right here. That is our goal. And if we can somehow disentangle them from the always takers, then we can find the complier average causal effect. But disentangling that is a little bit tricky. Um, it is possible, and I will walk you through the steps of how we do this. Um, but that is our ultimate goal, is to find the effect of the program for people who were assigned to treatment who did it. And we can ignore the always takers who were also assigned to treatment and did it, but they were going to do it anyway. So to do this, um, we're going to use a hypothetical program that I made up um, where there's an NGO that's distributing mosquito bed nets um, with the goal of improving health so that you can reduce malaria infection rates in villages. And so that is kind of the program we're talking about here. And to make life a little bit easier initially, we can read everybody's minds. And so we know if somebody is an always taker, a never taker, or a complier. Um, and so I have a column in this fake data set um, that says what they are, if they're a never taker, always taker, or a complier. Um, so this will help us disentangle um, the compliers from the always takers or the compliers from the never takers. So if we can read people's minds, this is kind of what we can see, that there are people who are assigned to a control group and assigned to a treatment group. Um, and if you look at the y-axis, this is their health outcomes because of using the program. So if you look at the compliers, which is this column here, people in the control group, their average health is like around 40-ish. Um, people in the treatment group, look, their health increased. Um, the average is probably up here in the 60s now. Like that caused an increase in health. It didn't increase it for everybody, but it increased it for a lot of people. And so that is the complier average causal effect. That's the thing we care about here.
The always takers use the bed nets regardless of whether or not they were assigned to control or treatment, and so they're going to have better outcomes just because they are. The never takers, they were, they're were going to have worse outcomes because they're not going to use the nets regardless of what they're assigned, treatment or control. And so you can see kind of the different patterns here, that the always takers are gonna be higher, never takers are gonna be lower, compliers, the control group is gonna be lower, treatment group is gonna be higher. Okay, so that, if we could read everybody's minds and see and, and distinguish between compliers, always takers, never takers, this is what we would see. The issue with this though, is we can't read people's minds. And so this is what we would actually see. Um, we have a control group, we have a treatment group, um, and mixed up in the people who use the bed net and didn't use the bed net, we have different groups of people. Um, and in reality, this is all we see. Um, I still have these points here colored by complier, always taker, and never taker, so you can kind of distinguish between them here. But in reality, you don't know that. This is what you see. So if you look just here, and you don't take into account that there are always takers and never takers, it doesn't look like um, it did much. Like the treatment group, it increased, but it also increased in the control group um, because there were people who used the bed net in the control group and that's messing up the results. Um, so what we want to be able to do is disentangle all of these different people here. So ultimately what we want is just the bed net people in the treatment group who are compliers. So we want these purple triangles here, the dark purple, not the light purple. So if we can somehow remove those light purple dots from here, um, then all we're left with is the effect of this program on the compliers. So in order to do this, this decomposition here and disentangling these, these different types of people, we have to think about this using some logic. So if we look back here, this is the, the table we were looking at before, was if we see that somebody is assigned to a treatment group and they do it, they are either a complier or an always taker. We can't tell which one because we don't know what is in this gray box here. That could be a yes, that could be a no. So to simplify this, we're gonna use this notation here. If you look here, this is the pi symbol. And so it says pi subscript A and pi subscript C. The only reason we're using pi, this has nothing to do with 3.14 or circles or anything. It's just the Greek letter P. Um, and generally in stats, the actual like Latin letter P is reserved for like probability. And we're not talking about probability, we're talking about proportions. So this is the percent of compliers in the treatment group and the percent of always takers in the treatment group. And this is the percent of never takers in the treatment group. So the, the, the pi here just means proportion or percent. Again, it has nothing to do with circles. It's just a Greek letter that starts with P. Um, so the way this maps onto our picture here is actually pretty interesting. So if we know that somebody was assigned to a treatment group and they did it, they're either gonna be compliers or always takers. And if you look at the treatment group and the bed net users, notice how it's the dark purple and the light purple dots um, because this is a mixture of the compliers and the always takers. If you were assigned the treatment and you don't do it, we know for a fact that you are a never taker. And if you look over in the treatment group, it's these yellow dots who are the never takers. And that's all that's there. So that's cool. Um, that's isolated right there. If we come over the, to the control group, it's the same idea. If you were assigned to the control group and you did it, we know that you are an always taker. So here's the proportion of always takers. That is our light purple dot. Um, it's all by itself. Those are the always takers. If you're assigned to the control group and you don't do it, you're either a complier and you're obeying or you're a never taker. Um, and we don't know which one. Um, and they're all, dis they're all tangled up here and you can see that with the dots here. So this chart here lines up with this table here that we had using the whole idea of potential values and we don't know if you're a complier always taker or a complier never taker. And you can see it's all disentangled here. So with that, ultimately what we want to do is we want to find the complier average treatment effect, which mathematically is just the effect of being, or the effect, the average treatment outcome minus the average control outcome for just the compliers. So we need to find the average for the dark purple dots, the average for the dark purple dots here, subtract them, and then that will give us the complier average causal effect. Um, 
that's tricky because we need to do some disentangling here. So there's an official math equation we can use to find this complier average causal effect. And here's what it looks like. It looks complicated and scary, but don't worry too much. Um, I will walk you through all of the steps here. So what we can do, the intent to treat effect, again, we mentioned this a couple slides ago. This is the idea that being assigned to a treatment group, regardless of whether or not you follow it, being assigned to it has some sort of causal effect. That causal effect is the combination of the effect of being a complier, the effect of being an always taker, and the effect of being a never taker. If you find those three causal effects, add them together, that is the overall intent to treat effect. So if you look here, it's, out, it's also weighted by how many always takers and never takers and compliers there are in the population. So again, we talked about weighting before. Um, like if we have like 90% of the people here are compliers and only 10% are always takers, and never takers, we want to find that causal effect for the compliers and then kind of say that 90% of that is for these people and then these are only 10%. So that's what this, this proportion here lets us weight things down. So we have three different chunks here. We have proportion of compliers times the treatment effect for the compliers, which would be this average minus the control average. We want the proportion of always takers in the population. We can somehow figure that out. And we multiply that by the causal effect within the, never, without, within the always takers. So it's the effect of this group minus the effect of that group. And then we want to figure out the proportion of never takers and then find the causal effect there. So the treatment group minus the control group. So if we can find all three of those things, that will lead us to the intent to treat effect. So if you look uh, here, let me, let me turn my picture off so you can see me. There it is. Okay, or so you can not see me. So another way of writing these things, instead of saying proportion of compliers times T minus C treatment minus control for compliers, so we can just say here's the proportion of compliers times the or the complier average causal effect, the C A C E. We can look at the proportion of never or of always takers. So that's this pi subscript A. So it's whatever proportion of always takers we have in our sample times the causal effect for the average for the always taker. So the always taker average causal effect. And then here we have the never taker average causal effect times the proportion of never takers. Um, so that's what we're left with here. Um, okay, so ultimately, that's what we want to be able to find. This is our goal. This one part here, which means we need to somehow mathematically get rid of or calculate the never taker average causal effect, the always taker average causal effect, and the intent to treat effect, and the proportion of compliers. So we need to figure out mathematically these different parts because ultimately our main goal is the complier average causal effect. That's what we want to know just for the compliers. But we don't have a time machine and we can't read people's minds. So we can't just look at this cool chart and say complier average causal effect is right there. Like we see it. Um, we can't actually see that in real life. So this is ultimately the three different pieces that we just talked about. Our goal is to get rid of all of these different parts and get the, the complier average causal effect all by itself. And we can do a little bit of algebraic trickery and logical trickery to do this. Um, for instance, if you are an always taker, um, what does the effect of the program look like for always takers? Um, if you take the treatment group minus the control group, that should be basically zero. It shouldn't do anything to you because you're going to do the program regardless. And so the, the difference between treatment and control for always takers is going to be zero. Same thing with never takers. The difference between the treatment average and the control average for never takers is going to be zero because they're not going to do it regardless. Um, so for the always takers and the never takers, the treatment that you receive is going to be the same regardless of what you're assigned to which means being assigned to a treatment group doesn't influence the always takers and the never takers. What this means logically is we can do this cool magic trick here um, where we can say 
there's some proportion of always takers in the population, and we're going to multiply that by zero. And we can say that it is zero because the average treatment effect for um, these always takers is going to be zero. It's not going to do anything because they're both, if you're in the treatment or the control group, you're still going to use the program and it's going to be the same. So we're just going to call that zero. And if you look at this, what is some number times zero? Zero, it disappears. And same thing with the, the never taker average causal effect. We're going to assume that that's zero because they're not changing their behavior if they're in treatment or control. And so that term disappears as well, um, which is cool because our whole goal is to get just this part right here by itself. That is our goal. Um, through this assumption here that the, the program's not going to do anything to the always takers and not going to do anything to the never takers, we got rid of like half of the equation. So if we come back to here now, um, this is kind of the logic we can walk through. We can say we have this intent to treat effect. It's all three of these pieces here. But we can safely assume that um, this is 0 and that is 0 because the program's not doing anything for the always takers and never takers, which then leaves us with just the proportion of compliers in the population times whatever the complier average causal effect is. If our whole goal is to get this thing by itself, we can do some algebra to rearrange this formula so that it says the causal average or the complier average causal effect is equal to something. Um, so that is this. Um, we just divide both sides by the proportion of compliers. Um, and that leaves us with this equation here, where the complier average causal effect is the intent to treat effect divided by the proportion of compliers. And the really cool thing about that is both of those things we can calculate using existing data. Um, we can figure out the proportion of compliers in the population, and we can figure out the intent to treat effect. So if we can figure out both pieces, then we can find the official complier average causal effect. So first, we need to find the intent to treat effect. And this is fairly easy. Um, this just means what is the effect of being assigned to treatment on the outcome. And to do that, you basically find the average outcome for people in the treatment group and the average outcome for people in the control group. Um, using R code, you can do this with dplyr, with group by and summarize. So if you have a data set with a treatment column, you can group by treatment and then figure out the average outcome um, across the two groups. So here, um, the control group is basically 41 health points. The treatment group is basically 47 health points. And so that's a difference of six on which you can do mentally right there. You can also use regression to do the same thing. Um, this is easier because then you don't have to do the mental math to figure out the difference. Um, so here we're just saying health is explained by treatment. This is just assignment to treatment. This isn't saying whether or not they used a bed net. This is just saying they were in the treatment group or not. Um, and if you look at the coefficients, the, the intercept here means they weren't. So that's the, the treatment group is, is switched to zero. Um, or the off switch, since that means the average outcome for people not in treatment is 40.9, um, which, if you look over here, is the same as control. And then being in the treatment group increases your health points by 6 points, 5.99, which is the same thing we found here. So it's two different ways of finding the same number um, is ultimately what we have here. So that is the intent to treat effect. So intent to treat in this case is 6 health points. So that's one part of the equation. The next thing we need to find is the proportion of compliers. And this is a little bit trickier to find because they're both or they're both tangled up with other things. If you look at the treatment people who use bed nets, there are compliers here, but there are also always takers here. If we look over at the control group that didn't use bed nets, there are compliers there, but there are also never takers there. So what we want to do is figure out how to just find the purple dot, the dark purple dots here are compliers. So to do that, we can do a little bit of algebraic trickery um, to do this. So one, one way we can look at it is one of these tangled up cells um, is the proportion of always takers and the proportion of compliers, because that's what we have here. We have compliers and always takers all wrapped up. And that is the, the people who were yes in the treatment group or people who used the bed nets and were assigned to treatment. So using some algebra, we can get the proportion of compliers by itself. 
Um, so we just subtract proportion of always takers from both sides. And so we're left with, like we found proportion of compliers. It is the people who were yes in the treatment group minus the proportion of always takers. The tricky part here is what is this? How do we find out what the proportion of always takers is? Can we figure that out? And the answer is yes, through one assumption. Um, and the assumption is that the proportion of always takers and the proportion of never takers is going to be the same across the treatment and control groups. So we know these guys right here are the always takers. There's some proportion of them that are in the control group. If we assume that they're split half and half across treatment and control, then let's say this is 20% um, always takers this side is also going to be 20% always takers um, because it's going to mirror what happens in the control group. We're assuming that they're split evenly across the two groups. Um, so we actually do know the proportion of always takers because it's right here. It's the people who use the bed net in the control group. Um, and that is our proportion of always takers, which means we know both parts of the equation now. Um, so we know um, basically, we can isolate the, the proportion of, of, uh, of uh, people who are compliers. So if we go back to our equation, this is the proportion of compliers. It is the percent of people who did the bed nets and were in the treatment group, yes, minus proportion of always takers, which happens to line up with the proportion of people who use the bed nets in the control group. Um, and that works because of this picture right here. These are our always takers, and we know that that is kind of the proportion over here. It's the same proportion over in the treatment group because we assume that they're split evenly across the two groups. So that means we can actually calculate this. Um, if we use dplyr, we can group by treatment and bed net use, um, and we can calculate the proportion. So that gives us um, four different proportions here. So within the... Um, so if we look here, the no bed net people in the control group. So 80% of the people in the control group did not use a bed net. Good. Um, that means 19.5% of people in the control group used a bed net. And that is our always takers. Um, so within the, the control group, 20% of the people there were always takers. They were going to do the bed nets regardless. So if we assume that in the treatment group, there's also going to be 20% or 19.5% of always takers. We have our number. Um, so we need to find percent of yes in treatment. So here's our bed net users in treatment. That's going to be 61%. And we know the percent of yes in control. That is these guys, the 19.5%. So if we subtract those two, um, we figure out the proportion of uh, compliers or pi subscript C here. So that's going to be 61%, which is here, minus 19%, which is here. And that leaves us with 41% or 41.5% compliers, which means we've calculated both parts of the equation that we need for the complier average causal effect. So if we come back to here, our goal is finding this, which is the causal effect for just compliers. To find it, we need to find the intent to treat effect, which we did, and we need to find the proportion of compliers, which we did. So if we look here, we ran that model where we just said the outcome is explained by treatment, and we can pull out that number. That was 5.9. So being assigned to treatment increases your health score by almost six points here. That's the intent to treat effect. We also have proportion of compliers, which we found on the previous slide here was 41%. So what that means is if we take 6 divided by 0.41, that will give us the complier average causal effect, which looks like this. Which means for compliers, bed nets cause a 14.4 unit increase in health. And that is causal because we isolated it for just the compliers. Um, and that's really cool. So even though we don't know who the always takers are and who the never takers are, in aggregate, making some assumptions like defiers don't exist and um, the proportion of always takers and never takers is going to be the same across treatment and control groups, as long as we can safely make those assumptions, we can find the complier average causal effect. 
Um, we just need to use three different equations here. So we have our compiler average causal effect. We need the intent to treat, which is just the average outcome for treatment group minus the average outcome for the control group, which you can do just with a regression. This is easy to do. Um, and then you need the proportion of compliers, which um, using some fancy algebraic logical trickery stuff, you can say that's the percent of people who did the treatment who are in the treatment group minus the percent of people who did the treatment who were in the control group. And if you subtract those two proportions, then you're left with the proportion of compliers, divide the two, and that is your complier average causal effect. And that is your treatment effect for just the compliers or the local average treatment effect for compliers only. That is really tedious though. We went through a ton of steps. It took us like 20 minutes to get to that number. You can do this a ton faster if you use an instrument, if you use two stage least squares. So what you do in this case is um, you use an instrument um, for treatment or assignment to treatment as an instrument. And that will give you the causal effect for just the compliers. Instrumental variables in general will always give you the complier average treatment effect um, or average causal effect. And so it automatically does the whole intent to treat um, divided by proportion of compliers for you behind the scenes because mathematically that's how two stages of these squares regression works. So as an example, so if you remember back to here, bed nets caused 14.4 point or right here, 14.42 units of health more if you were a complier. So if we come over here and run the same regression with two stage least squares, so we use IV robust and we say health is explained by bed net, but we use treatment as an instrument. Um, look at the effect of bed nets, 14.42116, it's the same. But we got that with just one line of code instead of lots of logical thinking and, and trying to read people's minds and figuring out if they're always takers or never takers or compliers. We could skip all of that because two stage least squares does that for you. It shows you the complier average treatment effect um, or the complier average causal effect. And so the results you get from instrumental variables regression is not a global average treatment effect because it deals with compliance it controls or it adjusts for compliance basically. And so what you're left with is the um, effect of the program on compliers. It's the complier average causal effect. It's a local average treatment effect, it's not global, um, but it's a useful way of, of finding the effects of a program on a segment of the population.